All right, welcome to the lecture on Thomas Jefferson, the Jeffersonian age. Welcome back from fall break. I hope you had a good fall break. Okay, to start off, we're going to look at the kind of the good and the bad of the Federalists. Remember that when Jefferson comes into office, it's kind of the beginning of the end of the Federalists in one way, shape, or form. So positives. One of the things they did really well under Alexander Hamilton was strengthen the economy. Remember, he created the Bank of the United States, a tariff to protect manufacturing, and created an excise tax. This all generated revenue that would help pay off the national debt after the Revolutionary War. The Federalists further avoided major wars, um, you know, wars that were going on in uh, Europe at the time between England and France. Um, you know, as we try to trade Barbary pirates uh, in the Mediterranean, and we avoided those wars that would have cost us more money. Federalists also made the, the government stronger to deal with the nation's problems. We talked about the national debt, um, you know, making sure that people follow laws, so like the Whiskey Rebellion. And uh, so, that, you know, that those are good accomplishments of the Federalists. Some of the negatives, if you can recall, remember that this is a, a party that is kind of uh, pushing not towards a monarchy, but a, definitely a strong national government, a strong executive. They're not really interested in uh, democracy for the people. Uh, really, they want to benefit the rich. They want to benefit business and shipping, um, you know, the, the wealthier, the elite. Remember that uh, under John Adams, they passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Act made it more difficult for people that came into the country to gain citizenship that would then be able to vote. That was to hurt the Republicans since most of those people vote, voted Republican and not Federalist. And then the Sedition Acts, which made it illegal to speak bad about the government in public. Um, you know, this today would be seen as very unconstitutional. And then probably the last thing that John Adams is criticized for is, is the uh, passage of the Judiciary Act of 1801, which created uh, over 15 federal justices. And since he is the president, he gets to appoint those and appointed them all with Federalists. Uh, and, and, you know, he did this right up until the time that he left office. And so they're kind of mockingly called the Midnight Justices. Okay, so that was a look back at the Federalists. Let's get on to the election of 1800. This is really the first election in which we see, you know, there's going to be a change. There could be a possible change in political parties. And so this is one of the ugliest elections in American history. There's a lot of mudslinging going on. What we mean by that, you know, the Jeffersonians, they charged Adams with being a monarchist, uh, with only catering to the elite, um, you know, and the Adams camp, they're saying that Jefferson is an adulterer and he's had uh, an affair with his slave and had children out of wedlock, um, that he's going to bring the French Revolution to America, and he's a radical. Now, the election of 1800 ends up uh, in a tie, but not in, the, not in the way you think. It wasn't a tie between Jefferson and Adams. Uh, the way the Electoral College was set up is that as a political party, you try, had to try to get the first and the second place person because if the you know at that time whoever came in first was president, whoever was second place would become vice president, and the Republicans were very good at getting their first and second guy uh, over Adams, but they did not um, talk very well. You know, communication was limited during that time, and so Jefferson and his running mate Aaron Burr of New York. Uh, they, you know, they, they tied at 73. And so now the Federalists, they are the ones in control of the House of Representatives under the Constitution. When there's a tie in the electoral vote, the House of Representatives decides. So the Federalists have kind of the weird task of they lose the election, but they get to pick who wins in terms of the Republicans. They end up picking Jefferson uh, as they, they despise him less is basically how he wins. Uh, after the election, shortly thereafter, a couple of years, there's the passage of the 12th Amendment that makes sure this never can happen again. And so now when you go to vote for president, you're pretty much just stuck with whomever the running mate is. You don't really get to vote for president and vice president. You only get to vote really for president. Now, many look and Jefferson himself was quoted as saying that this was a, you know, the election of 1800 was a revolution. And what we're going to look at in the next few slides is, you know, to what extent. 
So these are the ways that the the election of 1800 was revolutionary. Um, So it changed the naturalization law, you know, the, the sedition act, sedition laws, they actually expired, but then the naturalization law was reduced back to five years from 14. And this allowed uh, immigrants to come in and be able to get citizenship and vote quicker, more quickly. And they usually voted Republican. He also got rid of the hated excise taxes, much to the delight of the Western and Southern grain farmers. And he cut uh, government jobs, what we call bureaucratic jobs. So anybody that works for the government, uh, diplomats, uh, you know, people in uh, like positions of, uh, you know, the cabinet, things like that. Those are all called bureaucratic jobs. And he cut those by about half in his time as president. He also sought to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. He restored the Supreme Court to six justices after it had been cut to five. And um, then he withheld many of the offices that were promised to Federalists under the Midnight Justices. He also reduced the national debt by half, something he didn't agree with Hamilton for having. And one of the ways that he was able to do this was by reducing the size of the Army and Navy. So Jefferson's kind of an interesting character in terms of, uh, in, in some ways he reduced the Army and Navy, but in some ways he increased it. For, for example, the army, even though he cut the literal size of the army by half, he established the academy, or it was during his time that they established the academy at West Point to train army soldiers. And then the Navy, um, you know, he, he stopped making kind of larger ships, but kept kind of a, a coast guard to patrol the coast. And then later we'll see in, you know, from 1801 to 1805, as we try to trade in the Mediterranean the Barbary pirates from Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, and, and Libya today. Those places were notorious for extorting payments, and uh, so he had to deal with them, and so he increased the size of the Navy in that particular area. But here's where we see that Jefferson really wasn't that revolutionary after all. Uh, one of the things that was expected to the, for the Jeffersonians, they wanted him to get rid of, was the Bank of the United States. Remember that this benefited mostly the wealthy elite. They're the ones that had the money invested in the bank. Um, and he, he, what he found with it when he was president is the bank actually served some good purposes, one of which was that it stimulated the economy. The money was loaned out to businesses. Those businesses then paid back their interest plus, plus loans, and that was revenue for the government of the United States, which helped him to reduce the debt. Uh, he also you know, kept more Federalists and key posts of position in the government than probably his Jeffersonian uh, people would like. Uh, so for example, as Secretary of War was a Federalist, uh, certain ambassadors were Federalists. So instead of you know purging the entire government of Federalists, he actually kept some of them in and was a very conciliatory as his quote down at the bottom says, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. He kept the tariffs on imports, uh, whereas many people thought he would get rid of that tariff, he kept that. And then probably the, the, you know, the biggest thing that he does uh, as president during his first term is something that would be very Federalist, and that is the Louisiana Purchase. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the president has the authority to oversee the purchase of territory. Um, And so the only thing that comes close to that is a section where it says that presidents have powers over treaties. And so here we see Jefferson using the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause in his um, desire to, you know, double the the size of America. And so that's something that's very federalist. And it's kind of interesting how once you are in office, your scruples on constitutionality uh, kind of changes. And so what we kind of see is that, to some degree at least, we see the Republicans become sort of loose constructionists, and during this time, the Federalists become strict constructionists to some extent. Okay, the other thing that we see during the first term, well, and really the second term too, but mostly in the first term of Jefferson's presidency are his battles with the judicial branch. And what we need to kind of think of in terms of a big picture is that this is the last uh, kind of stronghold of the Federalist Party. They are, they're, they're never going to control Congress again after Adams. They're never going to control the White House after Adams. 
And so the only thing that is like a remnant of the Federalist Party uh, going forward is going to be their stronghold on the judicial branch. Because remember that if you are a federal judge, you are, you know, you're given the job for life. And some of these people served for 20, 30 years. And so they shaped America's future to a large degree. Probably the most impactful case during this time was the case of Marbury versus Madison. Now, you don't need to know too much in terms of the actual uh, details of the court case. You're welcome to read about it. But basically, um, what is established in this court case is that the Supreme Court has the ultimate authority to declare a law of Congress or of a state legislature unconstitutional, and therefore they can nullify a law. And so if a state law uh, is unfair to the people or if a national law is unfair to the people, the Supreme Court assumed the power. And where does it say this in the Constitution? This is, again, the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, but this is where, you know, the, the chief justice of the time, this guy named John Marshall, who's a brilliant Federalist, uh, he uses the powers that he believes are vested in the powers of the Supreme Court to create this idea of judicial review. And so this is probably the major power that the Supreme Court has, makes them the final authority of any laws, gives them the power to declare laws of Congress or state legislatures unconstitutional. All right. Another important proceeding was the precedent set by um, the attempted removal of Ju Justice Samuel Chase from the Supreme Court. Now, Samuel Chase was very much a Federalist, and he made rulings that were very what we call partisan. So they were very much Federalist rulings. And the Jeffersonians, the, the Republicans, they didn't like this. Uh, they didn't like really what a jerk he was. Now, he had committed no crimes, uh, but he was just very, uh, you know, he was just very kind of, uh, well, I guess you'd say uh, just kind of very anti-Republican in his um, in his rulings. And so the Republicans tried to remove him. So they impeached him in the House of Representatives, which just basically means you indict them on charges. And then it went to the Senate, but they failed to get the two-thirds uh, vote that would take to remove him. And probably the most important thing that comes out of this is that uh, that sets the precedent that you, you don't just try to remove somebody because of their politics. You don't try to remove somebody because they're a jerk. The only way that you get removed from the judicial branch is if you violate the law, if you do something illegal. And that's important because that gives these people uh, kind of the uh, authority and the assurance that they can make these difficult decisions for our country without having to worry about getting fired. All right, next, probably the biggest uh, event during the Jefferson administration in all eight years was the Louisiana Purchase. So just to give you quickly some context and background, remember that at this time in the early 1800s that um, you know Europe is, is at war again, and in particular, you have France and Spain against Britain. And uh, by, by the early 1800s, France has acquired uh, this Louisiana territory that you see in blue. And originally, Napoleon had hoped to use it as a way to grow food that he would then use to feed his slaves that are growing sugar uh, down in the plantations of the Caribbean, and then he would use the money from the sugar plantations to fund his war in Europe. Well, unfortunately, the the, the slaves saw the war in, in Europe as a as a you know as, as a way that they could then um, overthrow their French rulers, and so all this adds up to um, Napoleon just basically abandoning his idea of a new world empire, and so he starts cutting his losses. And he, you know, he ends up selling the Louisiana territory to us for $15 million. Now, originally, Jefferson had sent his ambassadors, Robert Livingston and uh, James Monroe, and their instructions were to buy the port of New Orleans for like $10 million. And uh, the, the foreign minister for France said, well, how about we just sell you the whole Louisiana territory for you know, for 15 million and they snatched the offer up and they, you know, they bought it. And, uh, you know, this is a huge quandary for Jefferson because here he has been the, the guy that has said that you're not supposed to use the elastic clause, but here he is knowing full well that if he, if he goes through with this, we're going to double the size of 
you know, the land, it's more land for settling, more land for farming, more land for natural resources. It's a good deal. And so, you know, so, so we did it. Uh, 800,000 acres. I mean, this is uh, probably the greatest real estate deal in the history of mankind, other than, you know, somebody just stealing something. Uh, we really got a pretty sweet deal. Now, keep in mind that there's lots of Native Americans out here. And then, you know, the the Spanish, they also claim this territory. So that that's just, that border with Spain is, is somewhat, um, you know, somewhat conflicted. But uh, you know, one thing was for sure is that we laid claim to now double the size of the territory that we had. During the time of 1804 to 1806, then Jefferson wants to know what we have and what's out there. And so he sends Meriwether Lewis and, and William Clark out on the famous Lewis and Clark expedition in which they, on their, their two year odyssey, they, you know, they collect specimens, they collect, you know, types of grasses and soil samples and animal birds and prairie dogs and all sorts of things so that we kind of get an idea of what is out there and through their tales and the tales of Zebulon Pike and, and subsequent explorers, this really starts to pique the interest of people to move out west. And so this will lead eventually to our, our era of manifest destiny. All right, next, Aaron Burr. So if you remember, Aaron Burr was the uh, vice presidential candidate for Thomas Jefferson, and he was supposed to be Jefferson's vice president. But once there was a tie, all of a sudden he realized, hey, he could be president. And instead of deferring to Jefferson and, and kind of stepping out of the way so that Jefferson could win and that he would be vice president, uh, he challenged Jefferson. And Jefferson kind of ousted him then uh, after Jefferson won the election. Jefferson kind of ousted him and he was a man without a party. And so eventually the Federalists end up courting Aaron Burr and they're like, hey, look, uh, we need New York. New York was a big swing state in the election of 1800. We need it back. And so would you run as our candidate for governor in New York? And that will help us to eventually win the next presidential election. And of course, being an opportunist and very ambitious, he switches parties and becomes a Federalist and runs in the election uh, you know, for, for New York's governor. Now, also from New York is Alexander Hamilton. So he knows Aaron Burr very well. He thinks Aaron Burr is very slippery and uh, basically insults him by saying that he is not trustworthy of the uh, powers of government. And so that leads to the famous duel with Alexander Hamilton in which Aaron Burr shoots and kills him. Aaron Burr then later uh, finds himself in the middle of a, you know, a conspiracy when he, he flees New York because he's indicted for murder for the duel with Hamilton, he winds up in the Louisiana Territory, and he, uh, you know, he conspires with James, General James Wilkinson, who's the territorial governor of Louisiana, to, to maybe take over Mexico. Um, there's rumors that he even may want to help the southwestern part of the United States to secede from the U.S. He's arrested for treason. He's put on trial, and eventually he's acquitted. But, uh, you know, he just kind of the whole way through is kind of a monkey wrench in American history. All right. So that leads us to the election of 1804. You can see by this time, very much a uh, Republican landslide. Even in New England, the Federalists are have lost ground. OK, <clears throat> on to Jefferson's troubled second term. Remember that he's dealing with a war going on in Europe. And both sides are messing with our shipping. We try to trade with both sides and both sides of Europe, uh, England and France. They are seizing our cargo. They are impressing our sailors. They are uh, messing up our trade between, uh, you know, the rest of Europe. Problem is further uh, exacerbated with Britain in the Chesapeake Leopard incident in which the Leopard, which is a British ship, um, they insisted on boarding the Chesapeake, which was an American ship, and they drug four people off that they believed had been British sailors at, some, at a certain point. Um, and this caused a, you know, a huge diplomatic uh, scuffle in which uh, you know, there, there were a lot of people now that wanted to go to war against Great Britain. Now, Jefferson, trying to head off problems, he, he creates this thing called the Embargo Act. And if you don't know what an embargo is, an embargo is a for, like a prohibition of trade. And so he forbids all foreign trade. He says, if you're going to trade, you're going to do it within the borders of the U.S. And it's really a disaster. It, it ends up hurting our economy pretty badly. And so two years later, it's replaced by the Non-Intercourse Act. 
which basically says you can trade with everybody except Great Britain and France, the two countries that are the most responsible for seizing our ships and cargo. And then eventually that is replaced by Macon's Bill Number 2. Now, Macon's Bill Number 2 simply says that if uh, England, if they stop messing with our shipping, we'll, we'll trade with them. Or if, if France stops messing with our shipping, we'll ship with them and embargo, you know, Great Britain. And so Napoleon says, sure, yeah, we'll uh, we'll stop messing with your stuff. And uh, again, this is just like the Chesapeake Leopard incident. This is one of those things that kind of leads us closer to war with Great Britain. All right. As for the impacts of all this embargoing, this uh, prohibition of trade with, you know, against Europe initially and the rest of the world, and then really mostly between uh, England and France. Probably the biggest thing that happens as a result of our embargo is the beginning of American manufacturing. This is really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it is a catalyst for us to start creating manufacturing goods of our own. Up until this point, we'd really relied on cheap goods coming in from Britain, uh, and now we're going to start making those ourselves. Uh, and quite, this kind of accelerates that. Now, the second thing that starts to lead us to war with Britain, ironically enough, are relations with the natives out in the West. Remember that um, you know the, the British were supposed to get rid of their forts after after the Peace Treaty of 1783, Jay's Treaty, furthermore, but they still had not done this. And what we what we are seeing at this time is that you know we have Americans spilling over into the Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, the Northwest Territory, and as they do, there's Native American groups out there that are not very happy that they're there. Uh, the Native Americans, they have been, uh, you know, trading with the British. One of the things they trade for their furs is guns. And so really the, the Western Americans, they see the British as the people who are arming the Natives. And this, again, is another reason that we're going to see the outbreak of the War of 1812. Now, the natives out in this area are led by two twin brothers, Tecumseh and his brother, who's kind of known as the Prophet. And they work to create a pan-Indian confederacy from Canada uh, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Jefferson, on his end, he basically gives the natives two options. One, they can assimilate into American society. They can start learning English. They can become farmers. Or the other one is to go west of the Mississippi River. Either way, um, they either need to start doing things the way we want or they need to get out. Now, William Henry Harrison, he sees Tecumseh and his brother starting to create this very powerful, powerful confederacy. And so um, he engages the natives at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Now, the Americans win and the Native Americans, as the story usually goes, they lose. It's not the last we'll hear of Tecumseh. We're going to see him in the War of 1812. Uh, and this is kind of the uh, the rise of William Henry Harrison. Eventually, we'll see him as uh, a president of the United States. Uh, but this is, uh, again, one of those examples of the Native Americans losing and you know more people spilling into the West. But really, this also is creating a situation where people are demanding war with Great Britain. And that is because they, they feel like the, the British are causing the, the major problems with the Native Americans. They're arming the Native Americans uh, with the guns. And so we start to see this group of people in Congress called the Warhawks uh, to demand war. Now, the Warhawks are important for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, not only do they push us towards war with Britain again, but it's because at the center of their leadership are two guys that we're going to get very familiar with. John Calhoun of South Carolina and Henry Clay of Kentucky. Remember those names because they are going to dominate our government for about the next 30 to 40 years. All right, so here is where we'll start next time. That concludes the Jeffersonian uh, period of presidency, and we'll start next time with.